1453 here. We're talking about the top five hand governors for Total War Three Kingdoms. Let's get into it. Prepare yourselves for disappointment as we start with Tiaoxian, a man whose unique resource is called displaced populations, weighing the value of helpless refugees and selling them across his land. He can only be called one thing. Hero. The benevolent arbiter, whose traits include philanthropic and pacifist in a game called Total War. Can't wait to play this campaign. His resource works as a scale, with public order, satisfaction and peasantry income if you spend the resource, remembering these are human lives, or if you let the human lives stack up, mustering times and construction times are reduced, and a whopping reduction to your food production, so you can starve your faction to death as any good pacifist. You also get militia and his unique unit's recruitment costs reduced. So if you want to have your army slaughtered by superior Han soldiers, go down this route. Looking at the man himself, he's actually got fairly nice bonuses. Except the virtue signaling can't be helped by having a 5% garrison replenishment to drive home the pacifist message, if that wasn't apparent enough already. However, like most players, his court hates him too. Most characters are spiteful, or handsome and spiteful, or there's more pacifists. Hooray. The only interesting character, Lady Mi, is the future mother of Liu Bei's successor, cheerfully reminding us we're destined to die soon. Joyful. Why are you smiling? You're going to die. His armor also has instinct. I'm not sure why. Strategy-wise, considering you have a court full of enemies, I recommend trimming the fat, strengthening your army, and then pick a fight with Cao Cao. It's scripted to happen anyway, so why delay an execution? His unique units are so trashed, they don't even give you them at the start of the campaign. They are militia tier units with bonuses when defending. Whoopee. The extra assignments and administrators do help, but they are not exclusive to the faction, rather Tiao Sun himself. So don't expect to have them for long if you're not playing with timeless characters. His unique assignment is neat, however. Overall, Tao Xian deserves his fate in history and our number 5 slot. King Rong, King Kong, King Kong Rong. Scholar, Renaissance man, the man aims to please. Now whilst he's number 4, let me lay down some facts. Kong Rong is one of the more challenging campaigns, however educating delinquent peasants is his specialty. Culture, education, trade, three things that define the modern man. Crossbow, an elegant weapon for a more civilised age. If mowing down peasants with advanced weaponry is your jam, play a Kong Rong campaign. No pacifists here. Kind. Scholarly and understanding. If Kong Rong was real, he would be a Pisces. Kong Rong himself starts with a bang. Population growth? Yes, please. Where's he start? Bay High. Who's his other characters? Who cares? Let's talk about the man himself. Noble Sword, Sevenfold Nippon Steel, look out. Trade Monopoly, his unique resource, is gained through trade monopoly agreements. Agreements. This man is honourable too, giving you high trade value. He puts the U in value. Academy of Culture? Sounds good. Education program? Gotta teach those stupid kids. Kong Rong is reliable. Population growth and discouragement of multiple armies emphasises a tall playstyle. And as a governor faction, you can kick back and watch the world go by. Liu Biao, Gentleman of the Han, the OG Libertarian, Master of Vassals, or that old guy. If you like it slow and steady, you'll love Liu Biao. Liu Biao's opening dilemma deals with the usual, slaughtering the peasant class who seek a fair world. With the uprising taken care of, you take the toolmaker and begin the slow ascent to imperial power. Now why is it slow? Well, Libya's mechanics allow him to make faction vassals from the get-go, and every vassal he has grants the governance resource. 
Governance is one of the harder resources to acquire, limiting your course of early expansion, forcing you to play tall. This resource increases your allowed domain, the territories you can hold, alongside satisfaction, replenishment, and income from vassals. Coupled with Lubiao's background of 50% extra vassal income, it's quite powerful. But if you exceed the territories, you suffer significant penalties. If you're lucky enough to grab the Bandit Queen, she can increase this 50% even further, though good luck doing that. Looking at Lubiao himself, he's your typical commander, but with useful across the board background bonuses. With the commander as your heir or clerk background son as an alternative, he has plenty of good early options for high satisfaction or plain tall. Your starting sentinel is a strong unique character. Aside from the unique background vanguard, you have nobody else special. Militarily, Lubio has two unique units at level 3 and level 6, the Infantry of G and the Imperial Defender. Upgraded spear guards, they're both fantastic. High morale and tanky, all you could ever want. His unique building replaces the inn, granting additional faction-wide experience or governance. With the Mr. Vassal's mentality, your campaign will involve slow expansion, but aggressive diplomatic vassalization. In both campaigns, the 190 and 194, you start out in a powerful position with good characters and access to good commanderies. Now whilst Lubiao is certainly a strong faction, I emphasize slow. This somewhat holds him back in the eyes of a list maker, but isn't a slight against the faction itself. You just have faster expansion options in other factions. The number two spot is Ma Tung, Protector of the West. As the sole governor in the Western provinces, Ma Tung has a unique access to the Silk Resource along the Silk Road, and to the Western Horse Pastures, synergizing perfectly with his faction mechanics and units. While there is synergy, his mechanics are lacking, with no unique resource. His unique building, Supply Lines, is useful, but not a must-have. One in your preferred recruitment commandery is all that's needed. Much better news for his faction, however, is his unique units and characters. Starting out with three useful characters, Ma Tung himself, his loyal deputy Peng Da, and his wife Hu Lei Li. Ma Tung has upkeep reduction, cost reduction for cavalry, alongside silk and spice income increases, a powerful bonus. Peng Da's background is nothing special, but starts out unbreakable, which is always top tier for generals. He also has early access to reach. Ma Tung's wife is also unbreakable, with the potent clerk background, reducing building times by two turns. A perfect early game heir until Ma Chao comes of age. Speaking of the devil, Ma Chao comes of age at turn 23 in the 190s start. If you're lucky, you can snag Sun Se from Sun Jian's faction on turn 17, but only if declaring the Tiger event does not trigger. With Sun Se, all cavalry have a 100% extra charge, making Queen Cavalry more similar to the Beast of Ar. Fortunately for Ma Tung, more good news. His cavalry units, the Queen Marauder, Hunter, and Raider, are all top tier. The best cavalry in the game due to their above average stats, but more importantly, fatigue immunity. With Ma Tung, Ma Chao, and potentially Sun Su's background bonuses, you have literal antiquity battering rams with bows. Coupled with all the upkeep reductions and cost reductions from horse pastures, Ma Tung has by far the best military of all the governor factions, Perhaps in all of ancient China. So after singing Ma Tung's praise, who's the best? Well at last we have the Su family of the south. Led by ethno-nationalist Su She, he's been dispatched down south to purge the Nam Man savages. The man's cut his teeth in Nam, so you know he's seen some shit. The faction is missing... something. Good characters but also unique units. Regardless, Su She is a powerful, powerful faction due to his main mechanic, Tribute Chests. But before we leap into them, let's have an overview of the faction, starting in the southern region of the map, surrounded by Han enemies and Naamans to your west. The Naaman aren't overly aggressive, and your early enemies aren't much of a threat. 
having only starting armies with no major unique characters to threaten you. They will bow before your bow before long, unless you sell it. But we don't negotiate with savages. You are free to expand at their expense in any direction you please. To the west, the Narman territories encompass some of the best commanderies in the game. To the north, in Wu, you'll find the other best commanderies in the game, and the other mafia family of the Han Empire, the Sun Clan. There is easy access to the weaponsmith in Puyang and the armorsmith in Chongsha. Cleanse north through the Han territory, sparing none. Splendor is gained from independent factions being family members. This means characters are either born, adopted, or married directly into the Su family. Characters can be made independent as administrators through the Grand Family Independence Council tab. With this you'll gain an additional 10 Splendor per turn, alongside all Su family members making Splendor gains. Effectively laundering favours through nepotism. What a guy. On the chests, they offer a wide range of bonuses. Construction, replenishment, income, and public order are all local county effects and stack considerably, allowing you to boost your income by 150% if you have 10 characters with the right chest in a county. You know what that means, Sub Family Casino. Because of this, the ability to significantly minimax your characters to the most favorable outcomes is why Suche is the strongest governor faction. But not to spoil all the fun too quickly, let's look at his characters. Whilst his sons are nobody special like myself, She is one of the best strategists in the game, with the brilliant trait and armor that synergizes with his other starting items. How do you get them? Political corruption. His son's backgrounds are weird, including a later character that appears to have a plus zero charge bonus. Relatable. Ignoring them, you have the ability to snag characters from other courts via marriage. That you can see in my tips, tricks and exploits guide. Or via the usual character recruitment and adoption method. Sersha has reduced marriage and adoption fees, so it's highly encouraged to recruit all the characters you can, as family members are free. Though watch out, the day of your daughter's wedding will be frequent. With a heavy emphasis on selecting characters, such as those with Brilliant, you can have armies running around the map with max replenishment, public order, huge stat boosts, and more. Through reforms, move towards Onyx Dragons to bring fire and fury to the Naman, destroying their natural habitats and murdering their families. All's fair in love and total war.